what a week it has been. First of all, welcome to Scottish Watches podcast. We have got tons to talk about. We launched our auction, over £25,000 in its first day. We had a party in Glasgow and I got engaged, all with the help of a custom watch. And we have a special guest that is going to grace us with their presence. We have Andrew, the man with the hand from Watchfinder. He's going to be here to chat about what they've been up to and what I have borrowed, not stolen, borrowed from their vaults this week. So all this and more on the show today, but the first thing you need to do is check the pulse of Dave. How are you doing, Dave? You all right? Only two fingers, Dave. Is it too early in the morning? You know, you need to warm it up gently with two fingers, then see where things go. I wish my proctologist would do the same. Cheeky wee proctologist for appointment on a Saturday. So how's Dave? David is good. He is alive. It's been a busy week. We've had lots on. We've had, obviously, everything to do with the auction. You decided to marry yourself off into royalty and we've got some other news from some other brands uh pollen one of the brands in the auction has some news as well yeah lots of news to cover in terms of new releases and all such like as well so i guess we should probably get on with it because we have a lot to cover well let's get things started off then with a brand that we've spoken about quite a bit recently and i've still to get in touch with the company it's been busy scottish watches tours you've probably heard this you've seen what we've been up to We've got some amazing news to tell you about how things have been going and in my personal life, as Dave just kind of mentioned there, it's been extremely busy as well. So let's kick things off with a long jeans and this is a range of watches that are true to life. Yep, these are the Longines Hydro Conquests, uh, a range of watches that have been, or should I say a family of watches that have been in the Longines range for quite a while. I think since back around about 2007 they've been in the range and they've had a little bit of an update. They have introduced a GMT complication to this range of watches as well. I really actually am quite liking this. There's a couple of colourways that are very to be expected, shall we say, a bit boring, but there's a couple of quite good looking ones, especially the root beer colourway, which is quite my thing. Have you had a look at these yet, Ricky? Yes, and the reason I said true is the fact that they've actually got a true GMT function, not a fake GMT function, which some other brands at lower price points get away with, but you'll explain more about that later on. I had the pleasure of checking out their new boutique, which is nearly a year old. It shows you how time flies in this game. But their new boutique in Glasgow, I popped in just a couple of months ago, had a look around, had a sniff, and was very impressed with what they had on offer. And they did hint that there was some new stuff coming down the line just before Geneva watch days. And yeah, these are actually tickling my fancy. They've got a nice range of colours, a good spread available. And the best thing about them, as everybody should know and will know by the end of this little segment here, the price point and your buying for buck is phenomenal with this brand. Do you actually have many long jeans yourself? Because it's not one that you speak about much on the show. It's not a brand that do a huge amount of watches, to be honest, that appeal to my kind of aesthetic. A lot of their watches are maybe a little bit more dressy, a little more kind of under the cuff, smarter watches. But I do have a few pieces from their heritage collection. I'm trying to think three or four, I think, have something along that, that kind of lines. They do have a habit of dropping a little re-edition or a kind of um, a watch that's taken a little bit of a design cue from something from their past that quite often appeals to me. So I've got a few of those pieces. I don't actually have anything from their divers range, I guess because I tend to err towards the Omegas from the Swatch Group family um, as dive watches. That's where my kind of aesthetic lies, maybe more so than than Longines, but I do have a bit of a soft spot for their heritage re-edition. So yes, I do quite like what they do. 41 millimetres in diameter, 12.9 millimetres in thickness, so very much in that size spectrum you'd expect from a decent quality kind of diver orientated watch there you've got this gmt functionality that's been added in proper gmt if people want to call it that i don't try or i try not to get too snobby about the gmt thing because they both have their pros and cons but lots of people very much say that you know you have to have a proper gmt that being where the gmt and the hour hands can be adjusted independently with without kind of affecting the timekeeping of the watch do you bother do you use a gmt or is it not that much of a luxury that much of a i don't know a fidget spinner for you because you've been playing around watches for so long and my second follow-up question to that just to keep you busy today is do you care about the absolute accuracy of a watch With a mechanical movement, do you give a toss? If it's one second, five second, ten second, if you're probably going to change watches every day or two and reset them. So I guess there's two 
very different questions, one of one of which will definitely be a bit more divisive than the others. So on the GMT issue, I tend to find, obviously I travel between the UK and, uh, and uh, Switzerland or Europe. So what I tend to do is if I've got a GMT model that's capable of showing two time zones, I set one to Swiss time and one to UK time. And actually I don't change the master watch show or the master kind of hand to the zone I'm in. I just have it set and I kind of look at it and I know which one's which. So I tend to not adjust them. Obviously, if I travel to Asia or whatever, that's slightly different. I will change the local time on the watch to the local time and wherever I am, whether that's say China or Taiwan or you know Singapore, wherever that happens to be. But I typically will leave the GMT set at home time. So I I don't really use it that much. To throw it back to the question or the second question, hmm. in order to be concerned about accuracy, one must first set their watch to the accurate time. And I am very much a person who will pick a watch up, wind it up, look at my phone and go, it, as a, at the moment it says 17 past 10. That, that happens to be when we're recording. I would literally set my watch to give or take 17 minutes past 10. I don't hack the seconds. I don't do any of that. I can't be bothered. I don't need it to be that accurate. I always have my phone with me. If I really, really, really need to know the time to the second, I use my phone. I'm not one of these people who sit with you know, time graphers and all of these other things to test the accuracy. I think when I first started collecting watches, it was a big thing. And it certainly is a big thing when I buy a new watch. And the more expensive the watch, the more I like it to be as close to zero seconds per day. I have a time grapher, I'll be honest, I never use it. I thought I would use it quite a lot, maybe when we review watches. But like you, as long as you set it, forget it, and it doesn't run away with itself, then I'm quite happy. But also know that it's very easy to set your watch very accurately. And the way I do it, and the way I recommend most people do it, is to use a website called time.is, which is what I have loaded up on my phone here. And this is really good. And it also shows you, you can program different places across the world where you can actually see the different times. And I've got that saved as a favourite, just because sometimes I do set watches and I do want to actually check how accurate they are. I have to say, I've used that website myself. In the very rare occasion that I decide for whatever bizarre reason that comes into my head to set my watch and hack it to the second. Fair comment. Right, continue with the watch and we'll stop going down rabbit holes. As we mentioned possibly earlier, there's four colours. There's your much more kind of conservative traditional colours, your black and your blue. They are very inoffensive. If you like a blue or a black watch, these will probably float your boat. And then there's another couple of colours. There is green and brown, or as some people have described it, more a root beer type colour. It's kind of like that famous fizzy drink that you can get, you can buy. It's got that. It's not quite a, a deep brown. It's It's got a little iridescence to it almost I would go to say both the green and the brown dialed variants have kind of gold um, hands and gold appliques on there whereas the black and the blues have silver so they're more traditional and more kind of understated I'd say of all of them I think I like the brown or the root beady coloured one and I'm not typically a fan of gold hands and gold appliques especially as all of these watches have a stainless steel case. Pretty exceptional value for money in my opinion. Coming out of the Swatch Group you've got all of that silicon technology and all of their kind of movement making prowess that you know some people like to knock it a little bit but those guys have you know significant capacity and technologies when it comes to making watch movements 2675 US dollars on a strap and a mere 100 dollars more on a bracelet this for me is an exceptionally good value watch for 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 the money that you're paying um yep i will wholeheartedly recommend this one if someone's after a really good quality diver either in a very kind of conservative traditional colourway or something maybe a little bit more punchy and you've not maybe got access to the budget that you would be needing for a Seamaster or many of the other divers or Rolex or whatever else out there, then this is a watch that you will not go far wrong with. The way that long jeans are moving around in the market at the moment, they're going to make some moves into Tudor territory and possibly eating the lunch of some of the micro brands, even like your Orises and folks like that. I think they're about to head in there. They're taking it away from that brand that you see in the high street. Spoke recently about Rado, Raymond Vale even, which I bought, which 
if someone had said to me at the start of the year, you're going to pick one of those up, no chance, but there we go. Now, we should probably move on from there and have a chat about what we've been up to this week because it's been hellishly busy. And I think you can lead off and tell us about, first of all, what happened down at Fears and also what happened up in Glasgow. The auction, we've obviously been talking about it quite a lot. We initially decided that we wanted to take it out to let people see it. And very kindly, Nicholas at Fears, who has produced one of the watches that's in the auction, said he would allow us to use his space down in Bristol to show the watches off and allow people in the south of the UK to get access to them and have a look at them. Now, that happened a couple of weeks ago now, but he as we've mentioned, very kindly laid over all of his showroom. Sarah travelled down, took all the watches down very carefully. She was very paranoid about any of them being damaged, so we should a long chat with her about how we would transport them to make sure they were all kept pristine and safe. And she got them down there and they went on display and lots of people took the opportunity to visit, have a look at the watches. And Nicholas did a fantastic job of helping us to promote that and getting people in, whether on one-on-one private appointments or whether he just opened up the showroom to a couple of events. He did an event with Sarah. He also did an event with the guys at Red Bar Bristol down there as well. It went live last Wednesday at 6am in the UK. On the Thursday, we did a little bit of a show and tell event to allow people to come and see the watches in Glasgow at Lion and Turnbull's main auction rooms. And we were super well attended. We had people there from Maggie's, the charity who are going to be kind of benefiting from this auction. We had the staff from Lion and Turnbull who very kindly helped to put this together, do the photography, the catalogue, etc. Myself and Ricky were there, along with a whole load of people we had invited and that they had spoken to to come and have a look at the watches. And a thoroughly great evening it was. I think you'll agree, Ricky, it was great to see the watches out there and having all the people there having a look and asking the questions. It was great to have everybody congregate the day after I proposed to my girlfriend so they could examine her ring. But we're going to get into trouble if we don't tell people to follow the show notes because we have phenomenal backup text, imagery, links on our website in your podcast player or in the YouTube description. You can click a link, it'll take you to our website to a specific page to do with this episode where you can see pictures of the watches, video clips, links to Instagrams, links to websites where you can find out more. And another thing that we usually do that we always forget, it seems, is the wrist check. And I'm going to be doing a phantom wrist check today, so you can't see what I'm going to be wearing. But Dave's going to go first, and then we're going to find out what I have got up my sleeve. Well, I've actually, I'm kind of got a dual wrist check, so to speak, on... My not proper wrist check is I bought a new strap and Ricky's going to talk about a strap I think at some point as well but my Apple Watch I've been wanting a white strap for my Apple Watch for some time and I eventually found one from a brand called Nomad who I do own a couple of their brighter orange straps shall we say but this one's cool it's called the Glow and it charges up during the day and it glows for hours at night. Super Lomanova could learn something from these guys because this strap is a photofluorescent material and it charges up in sunlight or just being exposed to lights inside as well. And quite literally, I tried it last night, for about three and a half hours it was glowing like a nuclear reactor in the corner of the room. So quite pleased with that. So that's my half wrist check. But what am I actually wearing? I am wearing something I've not worn for a while, my Swatch Fly Magic, or one of my Swatch Fly Magic, should I say. This one being the burgundy red stainless steel cased variant. And yeah, it is a chunky beast, 45 millimeters in diameter, nearly 15 millimeters in thickness. It is a derivation of their System 51, albeit the movement is inverted. So the rotor is on the top and you can see the kind of uh, red or the burgundy of the edge of the rotor as it turns as I turn the watch in front of the camera So that's where Max Busser got his ideas for the mad one. This one though has the Nivacron spring in it so this is your Swatch Group famously anti-magnetic silicon mainspring in there as well so this was one of the first swatches that incorporated the Nivacron spring into their, their watches. It was a Bit of a weird left field project from them. You know, this was a significantly expensive Swatch Watch. To be fair, it's just a significantly expensive watch, never mind Swatch Watch. There's many premium, inverted commas, brands who produce watches not even at these price points. What price points are we talking about, Dave? From memory, these were around a couple of grand each, if I remember right. I remember Glasgow Swatch Store had a couple in stock and I went in and I nearly bought one and I didn't. And I'm now glad, and looking at that, I'm extremely glad. 
that didn't. But yeah, there was a lot of hullabaloo when it came out. There was a nice presentation box. It was super limited. And the different boutiques, this is pre-Moonswatch by a good few years. And there was a, there was a lot of interest in it. And it really brought Swatch to the fore again. And this was very early in my collecting career, obviously. So a few people I know got them. You obviously would, would get them because you get everything that's Swatch related. We found that. Did you not tell me that you found a whole shit ton of Swatch watches when you were looking through your container? Well, actually, I was moving storage units. Uh, I um, ran out of space. I needed a bigger unit and was uh, portering things between the units and I found two not-so-small plastic tote containers. And I was like, oh, what's in this? Popped it open. And they were sitting on their ends upright, swatch watches. And when it's a 75-litre tote, you can get quite a lot of swatch watches in it. I remember during lockdown, Martin, up at Martin's of Glasgow, told us that he was in the store, obviously when he was allowed to be in the store, but customers weren't coming in. And it was a forced spring clean that was 30 years overdue. And he went through his stock room or his stock cupboard. And when he got to the back, he found, I think it was something like 20 original Swatch watches from around about 1990, brand new, with the battery separated, obviously, just sitting there in perfect pristine condition and I remember we actually did a giveaway on the show for a couple of them yeah this was one I'm pretty convinced at some point I'd been cataloging them all and as I was cataloging them some of the ones that I was maybe having trouble cataloging or deciding what box to put them in because they were not part of a family or they were one-off so they were unusual things I put them into a separate box and I put them aside thinking I would deal with them and then kind of never get around to dealing with them so Yes, call me stupid, probably very accurate. Well, I'm going to bring on a friend to the show, somebody that's helped us out dramatically over the years, not just since we decided to do the YouTube thing, and he has been a mammoth help there as well. He actually did a shout out on one of his shows, and we are obviously talking about Andrew, the man with the hands from Watchfinder, and he promoted our charity auction this week at the very beginning of one of his podcasts on YouTube and we are extremely grateful and thankful. But he is here to tell us about the watch that I have got to play with that I have taken out of their vault. This is the first time I believe he's actually been on in video, which is kind of strange because he's a guy who hid himself in video for a number of years, recently came out in a visual format. It's our pleasure to introduce to the show Andrew, the man with the hands from Watchfinder. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well, and hopefully your audience don't think too much. Ah, I understand why he stayed behind the camera. Um, yeah, it's been it's been quite the journey to 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 come out, as you say. Um, I've received various different comments, ranging from very positive to very negative. It's uh, certainly been a period of soul searching for me, but I've come out the other end of it feeling like a a more whole person. Yeah, I'm glad, and uh, you have been instrumental. And I was moving from the audio format to the visual medium. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for all the help, uh, suggestions, even down to some help you gave us today. But that's behind the scenes stuff that we can't talk about. We are going to talk about what I'm wearing on the wrist, though. And that's why you can't see exactly what I've got on the wrist. Yeah, so this is a Cartier Santos, or if you're going to use Cartier parlance, a Cartier Santos de Cartier, because they really want to make sure you know it's made by Cartier. Is that like Marc Jacob by Marc Jacob? Yeah. Um, it's, it, I, I, I assume it's to make sure that you do not forget that it's Cartier. And with this particular watch, I think that's absolutely well earned because um, in 1904, there was a dude called Alberto Santos Dumont. And you know, you know, you imagine what your life would be like if you were absolutely loaded. You'd, you'd be like, oh, I'd, I'd fly to the restaurant in a hot air balloon and do other eccentric things and everyone would clap and cheer. This man lived that life. He literally would fly to restaurants in the middle of Paris in a hot air balloon. Anyway, he was a bit of a racer of those uh, dirigibles, as he would call them, like a propelled balloon. And he asked his friend Louis Cartier to make him a pocket watch that he could use whilst flying. So he could check his time to make sure he's doing well in the, in the race. And uh, Louis Cartier was like, well, why don't you just strap it to your wrist? And created the first Santos watch and the first um, fashionable men's wristwatch because alberto santos Dumont, being as cool as anything was uh, quite the celebrity so one of the first celebrity endorsements of a, of a wristwatch the first men's wristwatch to be publicly popularly worn and uh, yeah it's stuck with the collection ever since in this particular case it is 
extra juicy because it's got a sunburst blue dial with polished markers, which I think elevates the watch to an entirely different level. Um, In-house group caliber in there, which is also really nice too. Uh, all comes together brand new for around £7,400, um, which which is pretty reasonable these days. What do you think of it? I absolutely love it. I'm having so much fun showing this off on the cameras here because it just looks good in every light, every position. And the dial, it's not showcased the best here with the studio lights, I have to say, but outside it looks stunning. And this is probably the first square watch that I've showed to my significant other, and she loves it. To the point where she actually asked, are you going to be buying it? <laughs> so who knows what may be in my wrist's future? It's the question we're all asking. Um, I particularly like the the blue dial is probably more black, but it has a sunburst that is blue. So it's very, very contrasty and dynamic. And you can kind of see the blue just popping a little bit in there. So rather than being solid blue with a bit of a glow, it has a real, it's almost like a propeller, the way the sunburst goes, which is entirely appropriate given the origins. Well, this was one of those watches where I went through your new arrival section and I've talked about this in the show recently. When I'm bored, which is quite a lot of the time, I will go through Watch Finder and various other places and instead of looking at the Rolex watches or the Omega watches or whatever, the ones we know about, the ones that we would look for, I click on the Lucky Dip and that is the new arrival section. It doesn't even list alphabetically. It doesn't even list by price. It is as they arrive, and you don't know exactly what's going to be coming into the vaults. Neither do I, and some of the strangest things I've seen in there have just blown my mind. When did they make this? When did this come out? Because I've only been into watches for seven years, and seen something from maybe 2010 or 2011 or older, because you guys have got vintage watches as well, it's just fantastic to see. It's like a jumble sale. It's like finding hidden treasure without a map. Yeah, it's exactly that. Um, stuff just pops on there as and when it's published, as and when it gets uh, processed through the service centre. Um, the the real trick is being on the new arrivals page and grabbing the good stuff before it disappears, because you know the the vultures are circling around the, the fresh hot page of new arrivals, looking for that cool stuff. Because the great thing is, is uh, when you buy pre-owned, yeah, you've got Rolex, blah, 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 all that, you get more access to it. But actually, it's the stuff that you might not expect that comes in at prices that you think, oh, oh, I'll take a punt on that. Um, that's the stuff you've got to be quick on. You've got to be really trigger happy to get the good stuff. Yeah, and it's exciting just going on and having a look and seeing what's what and then actually talking about it on the show as well when you're not here. Because we only get to chat to you every so often because you're a busy guy. And we should probably ask, what have you been busy with this month? What's new with Watchfinder? Oh, it's it's always hard to tell because so much is going on at any one time that I'm generally um, confused myself. But we've we've recently run over some fake watches with a tank. Uh, that was quite handy. We also paid a visit to the Vacheron Constantin restoration team uh, out in Switzerland to see what they do to their old, old, old watches to keep them up and running. And we uh, took a camera down into the Watchfinder service center for the first time in a very long time. You might remember one of our very first videos was the building of a Rolex Submariner to see the assembly, now with all of our fancy new camera tech, of a, um, a Rolex Datejust. Yeah, so three hot new videos um, bobbing around on the Watchfinder channel. Uh, I suggest that your viewers check them out or regret it. And anyone that is listening, you guys can obviously check the show notes for links to these videos that we're talking about just now. And I am still mesmerised captivated and enslaved by the absolute beauty of this well look at this this is stunning yeah i might have to actually buy this one in the mm, we'll not say near future because it's been an expensive month and uh, people may or may not know what i mean by that but yeah this just works so well now within the industry this month there has been some positives and some negatives a lot of people are actually running scared at the moment because the timepiece gentleman decided to do a scarper and owes around about $5 million to people that he's admitting to. Who knows if the figure is bigger or smaller than that. People are now a little bit concerned about dealing with the grey market, the second-hand dealers, and we've said on the show, buy the seller, as in do your research, go for a company that is well-established, that's well-known. And with Watchfinder having over two decades of experience and now being part of the larger Richemont group, which isn't going anywhere fast, what would you say to people that are a little bit concerned, a little bit scared about selling their watches or buying watches from companies? Well, there's there's all the tips that you can rack up 
um, that will build a keen eye to help you find good watches that are good quality, not fake, not franken, um, at the right prices, all of that. You can do all that work yourself. But as, as you said, really, buying the seller is is so much easier to do. It's it's really as simple as either do a lot of legwork or go to a seller that you can trust. Um, and as you said, with Watchfinder being around for so long, with the, the pedigree it has and the, the ownership that it has, it's you know you don't have to think twice really but we always heartily recommend people look into the past of a business or an enterprise that are looking to get involved in especially buying watches because you earned your money you want to make sure it's going to the right place and that your money is safe and your watch purchasing is a safe decision as well so yeah we fully recommend watch finder because you're around you've got bricks and mortar you have got Mummy and Daddy over in Switzerland who have got deep pockets and will make sure that everything goes smoothly because it's their reputation that's on the line at the end of the day. So yeah, if you want to tell people where to check out your stuff and we will let you get on your merry way because I'm sure you've got 14,000 videos to edit today. <laughs> yeah, search Watchfinder on any of those platforms that you can possibly search something. Social media, Google, the lot, or head straight to uh, watchfinder.com or .co.uk or whichever dot, uh, country you're in. And uh, yeah, you will find a whole bunch of lovely watches on new arrivals and see if you can snap up a, a real bargain. So thanks, Andrew, and we'll catch you again soon. Thanks very much. See you later. So there we have a Cartier Santos. Not a watch that I would possibly put on your wrist, but actually I am a bit of a fan of some of the Cartier stuff. Um, and the Santos, usually in the XL variant, it has to be said, is a watch that yeah, I have a little bit of a soft spot for, it has to be said. I was surprised because... When we went along to Watch the Wonders this year and we were, I, I don't know, brain blasted with information at the Cartier booth and all the models they let us play with, the tank, the crash, the the ones, I think there was even one with a small aeroplane in it. You know, it was just, it was incredible to see them. And when I was asked, you know, what would you want to play with this week? I thought, I'll give it a go. And I was mighty impressed. And as you saw in the video there, as you'll see in the pictures and the show notes, yeah, very, very impressive. Great price point, and obviously you can get a good discount if you get it secondhand, pre-owned, pre-loved from Watchfinder. It, it begs the question, Dave, how many Cartiers do you have? I have a Santos XL, and I have my other favourite, which I believe is called the Drive, which is the closest I usually come to something dressy. It's dressy, but with a sporty edge to it. But yes, I, I do very much uh, have a bit of a soft spot for some Cartier stuff, a brand that generally shouldn't vibe with me. A bit like JLC in many ways, lovely watches, but not a lot of what they do necessarily vibes with my aesthetic, I guess. But there's always exceptions to the rule. And an exception to the rule is where I agree with Dave, or Dave says something on the show, and I put it into practice, hoping to tell you guys a very funny story about how he failed miserably. But again, he's come up trumps. He has suggested something immediately. I have gone ahead with it and he's won. And that is, I took my room and veil, Pop, the freelancer that I got a couple of weeks ago, and I decided to go on a little hunt through eBay and Amazon for a replacement turquoise strap. And we're going to have to talk about the turquoise thing because Dave got backed up yet again by somebody from Switzerland that will appear on the show shortly. I'll leave it until then. We cannot slag him off any longer. He has been correct all this time, all along. But I have put the Raymond Vale on a couple of different straps and I've decided that the one that it's on that you'll see just now in the show notes and also in the YouTube video is the one it's probably going to stay on. The colours are very, very close. And for, again, £10 or £12 delivered, absolutely insane value. It's just, it's mind-blowing how changing the strap on a watch that's usually got a bracelet or even changing the colour or the material from leather to something else totally transforms. And it has, it's totally transformed the look of this watch. I may not often be right, but when I'm right, I am right in a spectacular fashion. And it has to be said, I have seen the watch in person on this rubber strap and it is exceptionally good. It's a great looking watch anyway. We both agreed even before you, in fact, even before either of us had seen it in person, we thought that's a good looking watch. But that rubber strap looks so good in that watch. It completely transforms it. And I think it's turned it from a really good watch into... That's a watch I think you will be wearing quite regularly now. I agree. And I never thought I would have a Raymondville in my collection. 
I never thought, even if they'd, they've never sent us a watch to play with, so it was a total outlier from left field that I never thought would actually come to be. But there we go. It just goes to show that if you expand your horizons a little bit, if you walk into some of the boutiques, if you take a trip into the city centre on your local emporiums, you'll be able to maybe spot something that, well, if you saw it on Instagram, you would just skim on by. But being there in person, seeing it, trying it on, you might actually find the love of your life. And uh, yeah, it turns out I might have found the love of my life. But I think, Dave, you're going to tell us the intro story and I might keep the juicy details for the next show because we're going to be recording our next new show shortly because we're away to Geneva for Geneva Watch Days. And I think we've got so much info and so many new watches to talk about in this episode that I'm going to keep those juicy details for the next one. But you can tell us the intro story of how this all came to be with a custom watch. So this all came about when a brand by the name of Bowcroft approached us to say, we've got this idea about custom watches and we'd like to have a chat with you about it and possibly come up, quickly show you how it works and let you guys do one. I love it when people say to me, do one. You know, I I live for that. You live for that. But also, to be fair, they wanted to see two people doing it. They wanted to see two people. Dave, Dave. There are children that watch this show. Hi, Logan. I mean, there are, but they're going to learn at some point. So, you know, we may as well tell them. (laughs) Their parents might not, so we'll do it. As I said, the guys at Bowcroft wanted to understand the process of how people would react to their packaging, how it worked, etc. So we kind of worked through it and we shot back and forward ideas, but it resulted in us both designing a watch. The most important one being yours, because you had a very solid idea in your head that you wanted to use this as a gift for your lovely lady. Because I am Scottish and I am cheap. This would be a spectacularly cool way to do something that is a one-off. It's unique. You can't just walk into the shop and buy it. And you'd already formulated lots of ideas about little things between both of you things that she's known for, her brightly coloured nails being one of them, you know, her fashion sense, we'll call it, I'll call it fashion sense, but she's got a very distinctive fashion sense. Right, okay, well that's enough of the preamble. Tell us about the process because I'm going to keep most of my details close to my chest just now. You can tell me about the design philosophy of what you came up with because we can now show everybody because the watches have arrived. The watches have arrived and essentially these guys have a template. So, You can't completely customise it. The case shape is the case shape and the dial is the dial in regards to the basic size of it, the shape of it and certain features such as the indices or the appliques. But pretty much the base of the dial when it comes to colour, pattern, style, etc. is a pretty free reign, it has to be said. They use a process, a printing process that allows for a huge variation in options. There are always going to be the little things that maybe can or can't be done, but they're very good at guiding you through those. I decided, not being very original, and everyone knows that I do have a bit of a penchant for the colour orange, to base everything around orange. And I went for emergency orange. So this is my card that's appeared with the watch, which details all of the information. What I have come up with is this, which is a dial that graduates between emergency orange into white. Now, it comes with an orange strap and a white strap. I've mixed the two together really just to kind of show the idea of the gradated dial on there. And what you may not see in the camera, but there'll be pictures in the show notes, is the text that's on there is one of my favourite quotes from A Space Odyssey, which is when Hal the computer says, I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave. Well, oh, that's what the lady said in Amsterdam when you visited them. Jesus. <laughs> that's what the girl was saying in Amsterdam. You're lucky I didn't say guys. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't, to be fair. <laughs> I'm being kind to you this week. <laughs> so that's another story. We'll get. We'll, we'll maybe talk about that in the future. But back to the watch. I, as I say, really wanted to use orange as my theme. And then I, I've gone through a, a few iterations and I unlike Ricky who had a pretty solid plan about where he wanted to go with it I'd kept my mind completely free because I wanted to see what the guys were offering and what the process would look like if you were kind of put on the spot so I deferred to some probably predictable cues that being orange but even where the kind of area for text in the dial was, I had no idea. And I flirted with a few different ideas, drawing things, sketching things. And 
came back to this idea on the basis that I was asking questions about, oh, can we do this or can we do that? And I think one of the questions I asked about, can this be done? Their answer was, essentially, I'm, I'm afraid we can't do that. That That's fixed. We can't change that. And immediately into my mind came that quote from Hal. Obviously, I'm Dave, David. So therefore, I thought that's actually quite a good thing to put on the dial. It's a little bit quirky, a little bit different. And the watch itself is a great little watch. Now, these guys are going live on Kickstarter to kind of push this idea through. All the details, again, in the show notes, if you want to have a look at what these guys are up to and you're after something that does, as Ricky will prove when he talks about his, makes a great gift and an ideal little present for somebody, whether they're into watches or not. Yes, and that is a story I'm going to keep up my sleeve until the next episode because it will take a little bit of time to explain the process. But it was a two-month process, including the guys from Bowcroft, including yourself, Sarah, Barbara Palumbo, Nick from Fears, and Simon Porter at James Porter and Son. Everybody kind of coming together to help me do something pretty cool and pretty special. So we will go into that later on. Uh, and I was celebrating for many reasons this week, obviously, with the charity auction doing so well. But other people that are celebrating are the guys at Bowcroft because of their Kickstarter, but also the folks at Pollen. Yep, absolutely. Pollen are relaunching. As we've talked about before, Pollen is the baby brother brand to Anordane. Maybe the Tudor to Rolex if you want, if you must. Now, the guys have brought it in-house. Previously, Pollen worked, I guess, at arm's length from Anordane and they had a couple of retail stores. They've closed those retail stores never really, I guess, recovered ideally after COVID and they've brought pollen in-house and are changing and tweaking the formula. They launched a couple of watches maybe a year and a bit ago called the Neo, the A, B and the C, which have done extremely well. And that kind of points towards the new direction of pollen. They had a lovely get together the day after we had our auction get together, a little bit of a new design language. They introduced a 10-piece collection of watches that are each a piece unique that have been done by a local artist. Really cool, well done. These are all based around the Neos that people will know, but with a couple of new colours, including one of my favourites, a purple dialed watch, which I have to say looked excellent. And more good news and happy faces from prior guests to the show. The folks at Elliot Brown have opened their first boutique. We mentioned this briefly in the episode that went out a couple of weeks ago, but yes, everything has now opened and you can find all the details in the show notes and in the description for this video. If you've not actually checked that episode out, then you're missing out because it's always an experience listening to them talk, not just about watches, not just about their new releases and what they've been doing with the company and the brand, but what they've been up to behind the scenes. And when I was coming up for a title for their episode, I called them the Mythbusters because they test things to destruction. If there's some kind of thought behind a watch, how military tank tough it's going to be, they will put it through its paces. They will drive a tank over the watch. They will take their watches out to a quarry and with the help of explosive experts, they will actually put, I think it was 500 grams of plastic explosive under their watches to see if they survive and survive they did. The loom didn't on the tip of one of the hands, but the actual watch and the mechanism did. It's a great episode. You can see the video, which will be out in the next week or so, because they are sending us footage. But if you want to listen to the audio version, it's available on Spotify and all good platforms like that. And Roger Smith, another previous guest of the show, he's been on quite a few times. Check out the back catalogue if you want to hear his episodes, has been wearing a moon swatch. And as arguably one of the greatest living watchmakers, many people will probably be aghast by this, but it shows it's not about price point, it's not about snobbery, it's about having fun with watches. And very much he is showing us here that a moon swatch is something to be had fun with. They are there, they're good fun, they don't belittle other things. And if Roger Smith can wear a moon swatch, I'm pretty convinced that means anyone in watches can wear a moon swatch. Does it have a coplastic escape on it? I, I am more than sure... Roger being Roger will probably have managed to open it up and do a full breakdown of its components. Great post on Instagram and I've remembered Roger over the years again proving how humble he is. He had posted Christopher Ward and said that's one of his dailies, that's what his employees or his colleagues 
uh, over in the LMN actually were because of the value. And this was before the alliance came to be, so it wasn't a co-pro with Mike France. And he's also worn various different Rolex watches, and we're not talking the upper echelons of the expensive Daytonas. I believe it was an Explorer that he was wearing for a number of years because they're just great watches. They work. Yes, people love them, people hate them, people hate them for where they stand in the market and the availability problem or the pricing, but they're, honest to goodness, decent watches, tool watches that are tanked off, ta tanked off and test the... that are tanked off and stand the test of time. So, good on Roger, and I'm pretty sure we'll be seeing him soon. Yep, absolutely, and hopefully he will be over at the Red Bar Global in Edinburgh as well. The plan is that he's going to be over, because... As we've said before, at the end of the day, Roger is a watch person as well. He just likes his watches. And as you mentioned there, he's worn everything from Moon's watches to Christopher Ward's to Omega's to Rolex's. This is not somebody who is so snobby about watches that he only wears what he makes himself. He loves watches for what they are. Well, that actually takes me back to a story. It was actually a video that I saw that I'm subscribed to on YouTube. And it's Crazy Ken's Computer Clan Adventures. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's this guy in the States. And he's younger than me and Dave, but he seems to be stuck in the past when it comes to technology. He has got an admirable collection, a bit like Dave behind him, of iPods. Uh, we've got prototype G4s, we've got power books, we've got Newtons, all kinds of things like that. And he delves back into history and showcases things along with a lot of the cons and frauds that are out there when people create Instagram reels and videos advertising portable AC units that are phenomenal for 10 bucks. He'll buy them and show you that it's a con. A recent video that he put out was about the Pebble smartwatch. And this was a deep dive into the history of the early days of Kickstarter before influencers, before Instagram really got its following and it told you the history of the guy that invented the company, how he'd produced a kind of smartwatch for BlackBerry. Remember them back in the day? The comments that had come in were, we would like something to run with iOS to run with Apple iPhones. And he created the Pebble and it was a runaway success on Kickstarter. And eventually, when Apple decided to come in with their Billy Big Boys attitude and took over the game, Pebble kind of disappeared in the background. I think that eventually they were bought by Fitbit. But this is a phenomenal 10-15 minute video that charts the history of the smartwatch to where we are today. And also one of the reasons why a lot of younger folks have decided to start wearing watches because they've been used to it with their Garmin's or Fitbit's and their Apple watches. So check that out. There'll be details in the show notes. And this is the episode for talking about folks that are involved with Scottish watches that have been on the show before, that keep in touch with us, that invite us to events. And it is the turn of Norkane to yet again drop some absolute bangers on us. And Dave has been a convert of the brand. He wasn't initially. He has said this on the show. We've talked about it many times. But there's a couple of watches they have just dropped on an unsuspecting public that Dave may actually quite like. Ricky might be correct in this. These are a couple of new models in the Norkane Neverest collection. A collection that's been in the Norkane range for a little while now. And I describe it in, in a good way as their answer to the Tudor Black Bay. It has a similar aesthetic, which is an aesthetic that many people like. A really good quality 40 41 millimeter dive watch. And with this one, they've done something pretty special. This one's called the Golden Glaciers, and it is meant to represent um, an area of Everest that is got a glacier with lots of crevices in it and it's regarded as one of the most dangerous areas of Everest for climbing and they've represented this with a kind of dark black anthracite dial with these golden lines that run through it and actually I'm not always and have not always been the greatest fan of some of the dials that Norkin have done but this one is a watch dial that I really can get behind. It looks absolutely, it's just excellent. So this is definitely one of the Norkanes that I will, I would quite like to see one of these in real life one day. Whether I do or don't is a different matter. Two variants in this, the Diver variant at 40mm and the GMT variant at 41mm. So just that little 1mm variant in there, which actually for me 
puts it fractionally ahead of Black Bay, where you're 41mm for the normal Black Bay, and I think 43mm for their GMT, which just pushes that watch into slightly too big territory. So these guys with 40 and 41mm have certainly hit the nail more on the head for me when it comes to size for the GMT and non-GMT version. It's hard to pick my favourite Norcane, and they've got so many watches in their catalogue and new releases that are coming out really quickly. It's almost Grand Seiko <laughs> levels of new releases and press releases hitting my inbox at the moment. I like these, probably not for the same reasons you do. I think that it almost reminds me of like a tiger's claw slash mark that's across the dial. That's what stands out to me as the thing that grabs attention. And I can't remember any other watch that's had something like that before. So that for me is the hook. But again, I'm just puzzled by where I would go if I was deciding today that I was going to be adding a Norcane to my collection because it could be any of the watches. It could be the Turquoise one that you talk about or the Turquoise one that we talk about. Or it could be the New York Marathon Edition they did, I believe, about a year ago that was in white. They've just got too many nice watches. We're running into that territory of Grand Seiko where they're doing too many good things and I just don't know where to look at the moment. Yeah, for me, like you mentioned, you thought this kind of tiger claw kind of aesthetic on it. It reminded me very much of a a Japanese art form called Kintsugi, which is where they use gold to repair china or uh, porcelain work that's been broken and they use gold to glue it back together and you end up with this kind of effect very much again like this dial as well so that's what it reminded me of but very much it's taking its muse from those jagged crevices in in, or on Everest should I say. Also a wee point to note is that 10% from each of these watches sold goes back to a Sherpa charity to help families and children of Sherpas that unfortunately have lost their lives on Everest and you know another good cause so another reason that if you like this watch a little bit of that money goes back to a good cause. And I think we're going to have Ben back on the show because it's been maybe a year and a half since he was last on. I got to meet him for the first time in real life and it should have happened three times. It's only happened once and it was by complete accident. He was across at Geneva Watch Days last year. He was on stage with all these extremely young creators, visionaries, artisans, people that maybe were from a watchmaking family or historical background. I believe uh, there was daughters and sons from some of the greatest out there. I'm not going to try and name them because I can't remember the specifics, but the details will be in the show notes. And yeah, we should be getting back on because the two times I was supposed to genuinely meet up with him was at their events over in Zermatt. And last year I couldn't make it because I was over in New York. And then this year, I was in the airport at 5am waiting for the gates to be displayed and it said it was going to be delayed until 2pm which meant by the time I got across to Geneva and then travelled the four hours to Zermatt I'd have missed the event. So yeah, I'm looking forward to catching up with him again. Hopefully I see him in Geneva in a couple of weeks time. If not... Who knows when we'll catch up. But yeah, you'll be back on the show sooner rather than later. Always good to hear from those guys because they're a young brand that are doing some, it has to be said, quite interesting things. Definitely. And you should be doing some interesting things at Scottish Watches. Go follow us just now. If you're watching the YouTube video, we'd really appreciate a like, a comment, a subscribe and a notification tick so you can find out when new episodes drop. We don't quite have the exact details of which days the videos are going to appear. We obviously stick to the Mondays and the Thursdays when it comes to the audio format because as we've been done for years, we're still finding our feet a little bit here. So give us a little bit of a break. And obviously have a look on our website. That's where all the news, reviews, previews, roundups, details of the charity, details of the show. You can find all that good stuff there, www.scottishwatches.co.uk and get in touch with us. We love feedback. Good bad, indifferent, email us. Do not DM us on Instagram. That email address is info at scottishwatches.co.uk and be sure to tune in next week because we have got some fantastic episodes lined up and we're going to be away in Geneva catching up with, I think, 30 plus different brands across the course of the week. We are back to back with meetings, recordings, catch-ups. So there is going to be an absolute ton. There's been a drought the last couple of weeks, but there's going to be a ton of new watches to talk about and bring to you guys. So you want to make sure that you're all subscribed and following us on every platform possible. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll catch you guys again soon.